Barbara Shemansky, Detroit, Michigan, May the 5th, 2014. All right. Little did I think I would be writing you so soon again. You can blame Leno Sanic and his intriguing links at the Black Op Radio site. Okay, this is, I think, this is the woman who wrote us the thing about CBS, um, that long four-page um, thing about, uh, what's his name? Frank Stanton, okay, which I read on the air, which is really an interesting letter. Right, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I reviewed the announcement link on the passing of John Judge. Having an interest in World War II, the Nazi war criminal C-SPAN caught my eye. Okay. Listening was very interesting information. It covered a speech by Richard Rashke, author of Useful Enemies, Enemies. Uh, John Demanchik and America's Open Door Policy for Nazi War Criminals. About halfway through his speech, Rashke managed, mentioned John McCloy. As High Commissioner of Germany, McCloy released or commuted the sentences of 30 to 50 Nazi criminals. Aha, I thought to myself. Finally, perhaps an explanation for a banker being on the Warren Commission. Maybe his background, not unlike Frank Stanton, had intelligence connections, as I suspected, his background yielded some juicy tidbits. In some ways, McCloy's early background is eerily similar to Lee Harvey Oswald, with the exception that he was extremely successful. I believe he was simply more ruthless. His backstory just doesn't jive with his meteoric ascent. I think he was a fixer and a facilitator who could get the results he wanted, no matter what the cost. McCloy's father was an insurance agent died when he was only five years old. His mother was a hairdresser to high society clients in Philadelphia. He was educated at a private school, okay, and then Amherst College, a highly ranked private liberal arts college. He enrolled at Harvard in 1916 to attend the law school. McCloy was in a Plattsburgh preparedness camp, a volunteer reenlistment training program prior to America's entry into World War I. These camps trained 40,000 men, largely the elite social classes. He joined as a second lieutenant when the U.S. entered the war in 1917. He was an aide to a general in the American Expeditionary Force in 1918. He became a captain of field artillery and served at the front. McCloy received an LLB from Harvard in 1921. He was an associate at leading New York law firm of Cadwater, excuse me, Cadwalder, Wickersham, and Taft. Okay, in 1925, he joined Corvath, Henderson, and DeGerdoff. Paul Kravath was a highly, in, highly influential to the development of this law firm. He originated the Kravath system and has been widely copied. His firm recruited the best of the best as much as possible from the law schools. He instituted a training program with a partner of the firm. He actually paid the associates a salary as opposed to the prevailing practice of nothing but what the associate could bring in. Kravath had an upfront policy about partners which were generally chosen in-house. In 1927, the firm established law offices in Milan, Italy. McCloy traveled through Italy, France, and Germany on business. McCloy did work for corporations in Nazi Germany. He met with Rudolf Hess. He shared a box with Hitler and Goering at the Berlin Olympics. He, presented, he represented IG Farben, a chemical company, which later produced Zyklon B, which was used to gas the Jews. McCloy, an avid Republican who supported Wendell Wilkie, joined FDR's administration. In 1940, McCloy was hired as a consultant by Secretary of War Henry Stimson, also a Republican. In 1941, he was made Assistant Secretary of War. In this capacity, he mobilized the U.S. economy for war. He was largely responsible for the internment of Japanese Americans. Earl Warren supported this decision. McCloy was involved with the development of the atom bomb and the occupation policy in Germany and Japan. McCloy served as government task forces, which built the Pentagon, okay? created the Office of Strategic Services, proposed the United Nations and the war crime, war crime tribunals. He chaired the predecessor to the National Security Council. He was chairman of the Army's Advisory Committee on Negro Troops Policy. McCloy initially opposed ending segregation, 
Before leaving the Army in 1945, he then advised integration. From March of 47 through June of 49, he became the second president of the World Bank. Okay? In 1949 through 52, McCloy was High Commissioner of Germany. He oversaw the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. He approved the pardoning and commutations of sentences of industrialist Frederick <clears throat> okay, um, Frederick Flick, a coal and steel magnate, and Alfred Klupp, Krupp, a steel and armaments producer. He granted restitution of Flick's and Krupp's properties. He also pardoned Mark Soderberg, Ernest von Schweischgarker, I'm not very good at German, Joseph Dietrich, okay, and Joachim Pieper, okay. These were all controversial pardons because these guys did some pretty bad things. McCloy helped hide Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon from the French. Barbie had been sentenced to death in absentia by France for war crimes. Barbie had been recruited by the U.S. Army counterintelligence to aid in anti-communist efforts in Europe because of his knowledge of British intelligence techniques, OSS officers, intelligence activities of the French in occupied Germany. This made him very valuable to U.S. spy network in Europe. McCloy appointed and or hired, while well, he actually did both, Reinhard Gehlen to aid the U.S. in establishing operating intelligence organization in Europe. The Gehlen organization employed numerous former Wehrmacht officers. Some additional committees which McCloy held. He was a trustee of the Rockefeller Commission. He was chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, head of the Draper Committee, okay, which uh, surveyed U.S. foreign intelligence, uh, excuse me, foreign aid programs. He was chairman of the Ford Foundation, president of the Disarmament Committee, okay. He won the Sylvanus Thayer Award, okay, Military Academy Award, the Citizens Who Serve as Accomplished and Exemplified Duty, Honor, and Country. He got the Medal of Freedom Award in December of 1963, okay. All right. McCloy was an advisor to FDR, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, and Reagan. Okay. McCloy served on the Warren Commission. He was initially skeptical of the lone gunman theory, and he questioned Ruby killing Oswald in the police station under guard, the ease of entry into the U.S. by Oswald and his wife, and his seeming intelligence links by Oswald. Dulles convinced him otherwise. McCloy brokered the final consensus. The Warren report stated that any possible evidence of a conspiracy was beyond the reach of all American investigating agencies as well as the commission itself. In 1967, a supposedly independent CBS News documentary on the assassination of Kennedy was secretly reviewed and altered by John McCloy through his daughter, Ellen McCloy, who was an administrative assistant of CBS News President Richard Salant. Okay, and by the way, Stanton was at CBS at the time, okay? John McCloy was part of the wise men, okay, that developed a containment policy dealing with the communist bloc, crafted NATO, the World Bank, the Marshall Plan, and the Truman Doctrine. He became a partner in Milbank, Tweed, and McCloy in 1961 and finished his career there. This firm acted as a leading multinational oil company intermediary involving Libya, Saudi Arabia, and OPEC. Okay, so in other words, it was McCloy who started the whole influence of OPEC on American oil, is what she's saying here. McCloy represented the Rockefeller family and Chase Manhattan Bank. He had a re relationship with the Shah of Iran. His firm provided legal counsel to Chase Manhattan Bank and had the Shah's personal account and his family's trust account. Chase International Corporation, which McCloy established, had several joint ventures in Iran. McCloy lobbied President Carter to protect the Shah's regime, along with David and Nelson Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger. McCloy had Iran's assets frozen, so Iran was unable to make interest payments on loans. Chase Manhattan Bank declared Iran in default. The bank seized the accounts to offset any outstanding loans. The bank ended up making a huge profit. From that deal. McCloy once called the Constitution a mere scrap of paper. As you can see and probably already know, this so-called banker had his fingers in many pies. The length and breadth of his career 
has greatly influenced the course of the U.S. government domestically and internationally, in my opinion. I obtained my information from many biographies of McCoy on the Internet. The most detailed about the complex and hidden unknown relationships was from Spartacus. It really goes into more depth and greater detail. I highly recommend it. There seems to be only one long biography on McCloy, which was Kai Bird's John McCloy and the Making the American Establishment. It's about 800 pages. There was also a book on the wise men by Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas, okay, published in 1986. All right. There are also a few videos on McCloy on YouTube, a short clip with Walter Cronkite commenting on his services for the war. And by the way, that's a really good one. If you can see that one, it's McCloy being interviewed by Walter Cronkite for that 1967 special. But that interview never made it into the show. And if you see the way McCloy behaves, you'll understand why it didn't make it into the show. If you ever want to watch body language, which indicates that a guy's lying his head off, take a look at that video. That, and by the way, Cronkite is only giving him softball questions. And McCloy can't even can't – even, compose himself to answer those in a really straightforward manner okay where can we get that video that's on youtube mr mccloy however objectively the commission may have set about its work the report itself it seems to us may just as well have been entitled the case against lee harvey oswald are you satisfied that as much effort was put into challenging that case as into establishing it. In other words, did, did the accused man get a fair trial? I'll answer that in just a moment. If I may just say one thing, I, I, which I'd like to say. In the first place, I had some questions as to the propriety of my appearing here as a former member of the commission to comment on the evidence of the commission. It seems to be some question, and I think there is some question about uh, the advisability of doing that, but I'm quite prepared to talk about the procedures and the attitudes of the Commission, and uh, I'm uh, the scope of its uh, conclusions and so forth. But I uh, will now answer, try to answer your question by pointing out that this was an investigation and not a trial. Uh, we didn't have any plaintiff and defendant. This wasn't as, what is known as an adversary proceeding. We were all called upon to come down there to I believe the wording was, the directive from the president, to satisfy yourself, that is the commission, what were the relevant facts in relation to this assassination. And that's the base from which we started. Uh, the, uh, there have been a number of suggestions that, well, that the commission, for example, was only motivated by a desire to, put, to make things quiet, uh, to, so that to give comfort to the, to the administration or comfort to the people of the of the country that uh, there was nothing vicious about this. Well, that wasn't the attitude that we uh, had at all. I know what my attitude, when I first went down there, I was convinced there was something phony between the Ruby and the uh, Oswald affair. The 48 hours after the assassination, here's this man shot in the police station. Well, I was rather pretty skeptical about that, but uh, time went on and we heard witnesses and weighed the witnesses. But just think, how silly this charge is. Here we were seven men. I think five of us were Republicans. We weren't beholden to, uh, to any administration. Uh, besides that, we, we had our own integrity to think of. There's a lot of people have uh, said that uh, you can rely upon the distinguished character of the commission. Uh, you don't need to rely on the distinguished character of the commission. Uh, maybe it was distinguished and maybe it wasn't. But you can rely on common sense. And you know that seven men aren't going to get together and uh, uh, that character and, and concoct a conspiracy with all of the members of the staff we had, uh, with uh, all of the, uh, of the investigative agencies. It would have been a conspiracy of a character so mammoth and so uh, vast that it uh, transcends any, even some of the distorted charges of conspiracy on the part of Oswald. What did you do on those visits to Dallas? Well, we went there and walked over the Dealey uh, Plaza, uh, almost, it seems to me, foot by foot. Uh, we went in into the school book depository. We talked to all of the uh, police officers there that were there, a number of the witnesses, visited the boarding house, the, the boarding houses that, that Oswald had lived in, retraced step by step uh, his uh, 
his movements from the school book depository to the point at which uh, he was apprehended in the in the theater we uh, chased ourselves up and down the stairs and timed ourselves i uh, sat in the window and uh, held the very rifle with the four power scope on it and sighted down across it see must have been at the exact spot that whoever the assassin was sat with the carton of boxes as a headrest snapped the trigger many times saw the because we had a car moving at the, at the ledge uh, uh, rate well i can go on uh, but uh, i'm just trying to give you the the, the impression of the of what was the fact that that we did assiduously uh, uh, follow this uh, evidence and uh, work out as best we could our own judgments in, 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 in relation to it. Mr. McCloy, the commission came into being late in 1963, went uh, through to September 64 when you were dissolved. Uh, could you have used more time? Uh, it, there is the charge that it was your con con conclusions were rushed, that there is some stringent time scale imposed. Uh, the conclusions weren't rushed at all. If there's any charge that can be made, and uh, maybe this is an unjust charge because I wasn't in charge of it, I'm inclined to think that we perhaps rushed to print a little uh, too soon. Uh, but the conclusions we arrived at in our own good time. I think that if there's one thing that I would do over again, I would insist on those photographs and the uh, x-rays uh, having been produced uh, before us. And in one respect, and only one respect there, I think that we were perhaps a little oversensitive to what we understood was the sensitivities of the Kennedy family against the production of colored photographs of the body and so forth. But those exist, they're there. We had the best evidence in regard to that, uh, the pathology in respect to the president's wounds. Uh, it was our own choice that we didn't uh, subpoena these uh, photographs which were then in the hands of the Kennedy family. I say, I, I, I wish, I don't think we sub subpoenaed them, we could have gotten them. Mr. Justice uh, Warren was talking to the Kennedy family about that at that time. Uh, I thought that he was really going to see them, but it, it turned out that he hadn't. It's not surprising that there should be some skeptics, quite obviously, to any such report. But how do you account for the fact that the disbelievers outnumber the believers by such a wide margin i think that if you want me to speculate on it uh first place is the credulity of people generally this is pretty spicy pretty scandalous so the bear in mind that there have been an enormous amount of, of, of books written now a large number of books written pamphlets written with the most shocking and distorted statements in regard to the evidence with all of the blurbs and all of the propaganda you, you know the business that goes with selling books uh many more th uh, thousands of those have been distributed and read than the rather uh, limited description this distribution of the report with rather prosaic accounts so that i suppose this tends to build the thing up uh, there are, other, uh, there are other things that I suppose you can talk about. Strange attitudes that people associate their politics with, the, with, the, with their belief or their disbelief in the report. I've gone to a number of campuses, for example. I'm astounded to find that they, uh, professors as well as students, uh, uh, in many of the cases, I don't say the majority, think that it's illiberal to come to the conclusion that uh, a... Uh, uh, communist inclined defector could have been the uh, assassin of the president it's it's liberal to feel that it was the result of a right-wing conspiracy in the hot the hostile atmosphere of texas and nothing that you can say or do seems to be able to dispel their viewpoint uh, maybe there's a general distrust of government and government agencies i don't know you can speculate uh, mr conkite as much as i can about it uh, i uh i uh what I do resist and what irritates me is any suggestion that the uh, commission were motivated other than by, uh, and, they were, and I'll leave myself out, there were competent people in that commission, people who, uh, who uh, were experienced in investigation, like the senators and the congressmen, been through many f types of investigation. Dulles, who was all sorts of, people who were used to dealing with FBI reports, appraising them, weighing them, taking many of them for something less than their face value. They went at this thing and they came to this conclusion and there was nothing fraudulent about it. There was nothing sinister about it, either conscious or subconscious in my judgment. And I, uh, uh, and I think that, uh, as I say, that uh, 
uh, common sense would tell you that uh, that this must be the case. Uh, we may have erred somewhere along the line, but uh, so far I haven't seen any credible evidence which dispels the the uh, soundness of the fundamental conclusions that we came to. Most people, when they talk about how bad the Warren Commission is, they talk about uh, Dulles and Ford, but McCloy was just as bad, okay, if you really want to dig into his background. I mean, he was really in the middle of a lot of really bad things, like the pardoning of all those uh, Nazis in uh, West Germany after the war, and also the Japanese internment, and also the um, talking Carter into bringing in the Shah of Iran, okay, and the, which, of course, caused the taking of the embassy, and which really brought us Ronald Reagan. Because if it wasn't for that, Carter might have got it reelected that year and would have saved us all from the scourge of Ronald Reagan. So McCloy was really a pretty bad guy. And the worst thing about McCloy is that he never really seemed to regret anything he did. Like, for example, the Japanese internment when the Congress decided to go ahead and give those people some money. Like, I think it was like $24,000 or something, you know, which was nothing compared to what those poor people lost, okay? McCloy was totally opposed to it, okay? He called it unconscionable, all right? And he testified against it, all right? I mean, that's how bad this guy was. I mean, what do you expect from a guy who helps Claus Barbie, you know, escape, uh, you know, to South America? But that's another thing that McCloy did, all right? So that's why I concluded in my book you know, uh, reclaiming Parkland, that to expect the Warren Commission with these guys on it, Ford, Dulles, and McCloy, to do anything about a high-level conspiracy within the United States government, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's stupid to think that these guys would do it because they had been covering up this kind of stuff all their lives. All right? <clears throat> okay, let's have one more question here. Uh, Chad Brown.